what do you want and who are you committed to being in order to make that happen? And when you get really clear, write it down. What are the qualities? What are the attributes? Like, how are you committed to showing up? You'll start to make progress towards that. But keep in mind, I take that word committed seriously, not who are you interested in being, if it's comfortable, who are you committed to being? Because that's the only version of you that's going to turn your relationship around, that's going to turn your health around, that's going to turn your finances around. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Last Life Ever podcast. My name is Jillian Sidoti. I'm always with my co-host, Jeffrey Holst, who is going to tell us who we have on the show today. Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, I'm so excited about the episode today, Jillian, because boy, you have one of my really good friends and my personal life coach, Dr. Jamil Syaj, on not for the first time. He was actually on once before, and we're bringing him back to talk about um, living the best version of your life, which is something that's very near and dear to our show. Um, <laughs> but, and I think he has some amazing things to share with us about that. But I want to share a little bit about my experience with Jamil because I think it's useful for the audience to understand how great this guy actually is. Now, he doesn't know I'm going to say this, but we actually disagree on a lot of stuff. Like I know, like personally, like the two of us have differences of opinion on many, many, many things. But what I love about Jamil is that he is so full of love that he um, is completely and totally respectful in his disrespect, if that makes any sense. And he is the kind of guy who like, if you talk to him, he he will try to understand your perspective more than any person I've ever met in my life. And I think that that's something we definitely need to get digging into. But anyway, I don't want to go on and on about how great he is. He's an international spiritual wisdom teacher, an energy healer, a transformation coach, life transformation coach. And I think a naturopathic physician, like he's actually trained in that. And he's the host of a show called Transformation Starts Today. It's a podcast I love and you guys should check out. But without further ado, Jillian, let's just go ahead and bring him on the show. Thank you so much for being here. You know, I talk to you every 10 days now for like three years. So I feel like we're like best friends, but um, the rest of the world doesn't know you as well as I do. So um, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you, Jillian and Jeff. So wonderful to be with you again. I'll keep it real simple for our audience, our listeners. I love people. I love being with people. I love seeing people lit up in love with their life, in love with how they're showing up in the world. I love helping people to heal, to remember who they really are and to create miracles in their life. And when I think about, I don't take that lightly. When I think about a miracle, there's certain things that you think are possible for your world, for your life, for what you can have, for what you can experience. And if I can help shift that, where now you see yourself in the world differently, what seemed impossible before, now you know you can do it. And then you actually do it. And what I often love saying is, let's take your goal, your dream that you think is 10 years out, and let's make it real in 10 months. And I've got multiple examples of people doing that in so many different areas of life. And you're no different. But it starts with, how are you choosing to show up in the world? And that's probably a great place that we could begin our conversation. But I'll turn it back to you both. Mm, thank you. What does somebody have to do? Like as somebody who had a, you know, traumatic couple of years and I had to like think about, I had to really think about what do I want to do next? And I unfortunately kind of rushed into doing things the next thing, right? Next, like, hey, this is my new purpose. Like if you were talking to somebody like me, who gets to a point where they're like, I have to make a change and I got to make it now. What do you think the first step is that they have to take? Mm -hmm. So I think I'm going to answer that in two ways. And so that's a great question. And I think for so many of our listeners, they can relate to it. I think the wrong, the wrong approach, and I don't use wrong or right in like a judgmental sense, but wrong in the sense that it won't serve you as well. The wrong approach is to focus on what do I need to do? Because mm -hmm. that's focusing on strategy Strategy comes second. The most important question, well, prior to that, it's like, here's this stuff that's happened in my past, the stuff that's happened in my future. And I'm using that to, in a way, define me now and in a way, put me in a box and limit what I might be able to do going forward into the future. The most important question for me is who am I committed to being in this moment going forward? So if what kind of life am I committed to living and what kind of person am I committed to being? So if, for example, let's say somebody was having an issue in their relationship 
and they came to me and we're having a conversation and they could tell me about, you know, so-and-so is recommending I do this and I read this book and it's saying to do that. And I'm thinking about what do you think I should do? To me, that's the wrong question. The wrong question is, well, who are you committed to being as a partner? And let's say you say, well, I'm committed to being loving and understanding and compassionate and understanding and respectful and whatever, whatever else. Okay. So if you, and I'm committed to being, let's say, let's say I'm speaking with a man. I'm committed to being the best husband ever. Okay. What would the best husband do in this situation? Probably not what you were about to do if you were in a headspace of, you know, anger and resentment. What, what would a, what would a person filled with love and compassion and understanding do? How would they show up to this conversation? The interesting thing is if you focus on how you want to be, who you want to be, the doing often takes care of itself. And so I would start with that first because people are so quick to jump to the strategy. What should I do? If you start with who do I want to be, the strategy often unfolds naturally from that. Let's let's go back to that for a second. Um, let's talk about that. So that's really interesting. Like somebody says, like, I want to be the best husband, but they're angry and resentful. What is... And, let's assume for a, a, a minute, the anger and the resentment, whether it's misplaced or not, right? Is, is they, they feel anger and resentment. So how do they move past the anger and resentment first so that they can show up and be those things? Because to me, like just hearing that, that's, you first have to get rid of the anger and resentment. So how do you do that? Yeah. So in that example, if who I want to be is the world's greatest husband, who I'm being right now is anger and resentment. So that's who I'm being. So that's why anger and resentment is showing up. So if we want to shift that first, we bring the awareness to it. So who am I being right now? I'm being anger and resentment. Well, how's that playing out? How's that working for me? How does it feel? And it's not going to feel good. And then you say, well, I want to shift. Well, what would I want to be instead? So give me just some examples, Jillian. If you don't want to be anger and resentment, what do you think this person would want to be? Uh, joyful, um, full of love, um, happy. Uh, you know, I, I could just see like, if you're, I, I, and I'm just, I, you know, it's funny cause Jeff started this out saying like trying to see the perspective of people. So in that, like, and I'm, I'm not, a, I'm not an angry or resentful man. Sure. Right. Yeah. So Right. So, but like, like if I'm trying to look at the point of view of the angry, resentful man, right. Yeah. Who wants to be a good husband, but has this anger and resentment. Mm -hmm. I guess my question is, is like, how do we get them? How, yeah. how do we get that man to stop being angry and resentful? And can yeah. we, or, or is yeah. it something he can't control? Right. Oh, no. So if the answer is we absolutely can. And this man absolutely can control it. And this is why. Okay. Anger and resentment. So for any emotion, so I ask you, you, you gave me joy and full of love. So that's perfect. Any emotion is an internal creation. Anger is not outside of you. Nothing outside of you causes you to feel anything. The moment you oh. say, so the moment we say someone or something caused you to feel something is the moment you disempower yourself and you put yourself at effect to life and to the situation and to the person. There are people in the world who a certain thing happens to them and they feel really angry and furious. There's other people in the world that the same thing happens to them, but their internal response is different. So a different emotion shows up. There's, I know you two are big into the real estate world and, and many different worlds, but there are people right now in the real estate world that are freaking out and panicking and not doing well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know people, clients of mine in the real estate world, that are seeing so much opportunity right now and are seeing it very differently. So they're having a very different internal response. So this mm -hmm. hypothetical, man who's filled with anger and resentment right now the question is if i'm speaking to this man and and my preface is always this man knows i'm speaking to him from a space of deep and immense respect for who he is and love for him but i'm also going to challenge his paradigm because if i see the world the same way you do i can't help you so i have mm -hmm. to show a different way of seeing life and so let, in this example how are you creating anger and resentment What's the story that you're buying into and believing and telling yourself? So I'll give you an example. This husband, let's say, is angry with his partner. And he's telling himself a story about this partner showing up in a certain way. This was their intention. This is what they meant. Oh, my God, they always do this. They don't respect me for all these reasons. When you yes. tell yourself a story, yeah. 
of course the downstream effect is going to be anger and resentment. The right, group, right. You can tell different stories. And so even if I'm upset with somebody, let's say I'm upset with my partner and I say, okay, if I wanted to look through the lens of gratitude for this person, as angry as I might be, are there a few things that I could be grateful for right now about this person? Mm -hmm. And then you would go, well, yeah. So imagine I have kids. I don't right now, but let's say, say okay, I'm grateful because this is the mother of my children. I'm grateful because she put up a lot to make this happen. I'm grateful because when I was at some of my darkest times, this person showed up for me. This person was there to support me. You know, is there anything I can look at right now in this person that actually isn't what I'm making up? So for example, there's a quote that I love, one of many. Forgiveness is realizing that what, what I thought happened didn't. So here's this thought I have in my mind. This person did something. This was their intention. I'm upset for that reason. But what if that wasn't their intention? Right. What, no, and I'm assuming that. You know, every one of us has an experience at some point in our life of somebody, um, imagine right now, this is a funny example. Imagine right now, one of you just dropped the, the call. And now, yeah. Let's, yeah. let's say it's me and Jillian and Jeff drops the call. And now I just get offended. And I go, oh my God, how rude. Jeff just left. <laughs> how could he do that? I, 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 I thought I knew him. <laughs> and I just get upset. And I just start like getting really angry with him. And then he comes back on five minutes later and he says, oh, sorry about that. The internet went out and I was doing everything I could to fix it. And then Jeff comes mm -hmm. back. But the whole time, the reasons why I was upset with Jeff had nothing to do with reality. Mm -hmm. and you I know what? I, I'm going to interrupt for a second. This reminds me of, um, I don't remember when you told me this, but a long time ago when we were having a conversation, you told me a story about someone who was upset because they're um, dinner date or, or friend or something didn't show up. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and in the story, I mean, I'm on a super short paraphrase. It was the person was like, had a conversation with them and said, it's really important to me that you respect my time. You consistently are being late. And the person said, yeah, I'm going to show up on time from now on, no matter what. And then the very next time that they were supposed to meet up, they didn't show up on time and they got really angry and they're like, I can't believe he would do this to me. I'm never going to talk to this person again. And then found out later that they were in like some kind of horrible accident and they, they were trying really hard to get a hold of them, but their phone had been destroyed. You know, there was just nothing they could do to get that in. And then the person feels bad. Right. And the point of the story, I think par super paraphrase is that, that how that person reacted wasn't based on reality. It was based on their perception of reality. And so I think what Jamil is saying is if, you're upset at someone, you're that angry husband, you can look at what that person did to you and you can say, you know what, I'm going to choose to try to understand where they're coming from, what happened. And I'm going to choose to understand how a better way for me to react is, even if the person did something horrible to you. Like, like for example, you could say, hey, my partner cheated on me. That that was terrible. I, I, I'm going to be angry about that. I'm upset about that. But you can turn that around and you can say, they're trying to work it out right now. What what are they're making these actions? They're being contrite. They're they're you could continue to be angry or you can choose to try to understand the difficulty that they're in, even if it is their own fault. They're still, you know, if 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 they're being remorseful, they're feeling like, whoa, I made this big mistake and I want to fix it. And there's no, there's no way to change what already happened, but you can change how you respond to that thing. Yeah. If I may just add to your story, spot on. So often the yeah, but that comes up in this type of conversation is you gave the example, like a partner cheats on you or something really horrendous happens. And people think that well, in those situations, what do I do? There's an internal and there's an external. On the external, start with that there is a love for yourself and boundaries that you enforce. And it's like, okay, there's certain things that are not okay in the world I want to live in, the life I want to create. It might be the partner cheats on me. I'm not in a relationship with them anymore. It might be something in a business happens. That's not okay. Whatever it might be, you have your boundaries, you enforce them out of self-love and out of just, you know, the life you want to create. But there's the internal component of I'm feeling a certain way. I don't want to be feeling that way. Now, what caused that emotion? If I say it was that person or that situation, 
then I'm going to keep feeling what I'm feeling until that person or situation changes their mind, which could take a long time. Or I can recognize, well, my emotions created by me. So if I am committed in this case to being in this relationship of this hypothetical guy we talked about, I'm angry with my wife, let's say, I don't want to be. In Jillian's words, I want to be full of love and I want to be joyful. So what's a different story I could tell myself? What conversation could I have with this person that is letting out? So for example, I might say, honey, I've got something on my heart that's really important for me to share with you. I think it would really improve our relationship. It'll take about an hour. Do you have a time now? Oh yeah, of course. What's going on? You know, I've been feeling recently a lot of anger. And originally I thought it was because of you. And I realized actually in hindsight, I've, when I thought about it, it's not because of you. It's because of all these things that are going on in my world right now. And I was projecting it out onto you. That's not fair to you. I have been short with you recently and I've been impatient, let's say, and that's not okay. That's not the kind of man I want to be in the relationship. I'm not committed to that. And I recognize that there's certain behaviors that bother me. I never said anything about it. And so they keep happening. Can we talk about that? Here's like the three things. When you do this, I often feel this way. Would you mind not doing that? Or could we handle it this way? You have a conversation like that. The relationship shifts. You have a conversation like that. If your partner wants to be with you, they're going to say, oh my God, I didn't know that bothered you. Yeah, I won't do it anymore. Or I'm going to be better about it. Or there's going to be some negotiation. There's going to be, you know, there's something on my heart I want to share too. There's that unspoken truth for you that until you speak it out, it creates whatever your internal situation is. So it's like, there's so much going on inside that we then project out and we, until we have that conversation, until we're willing to own our truth, own our power to create our experience, we live victim to the world versus mm -hmm. living as a creator of our experience. Well, let's, let's, let me ask something about that. Cause this is very interesting and it's really easy. I'm, I'm great at walking away from relationships. I have no problem doing that. I will walk away from a relationship in a hot second. It's probably, it sounds like a really good quality, but it's actually a huge flaw, right? Like, because I just don't, I'm done with you. Right. Oh, but, but just don't say that to me anytime soon. I'd be really no. sad. Especially yeah, yeah. if it's before we go to um, Bali next week. No. <laughs> that would be really terrible. But, but let's just say, for example, you're in a relationship of any type, any type of relationship, and somebody does something consistently, consistently that is bothersome and disrespectful to you, like in Jeff's example of the person who's always late, and they just don't change. Do we just ignore the behavior? Do we go, okay, I tried, it does, like what? What do we do if that behavior just won't change, but you're not willing to sacrifice the relationship for it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so the, the last part you said, that, that caveat it will change my response. But this is basically in any situation, first keep a big picture, whether it's mm -hmm. in a relationship or any other area of life, you're in a situation that you don't like. So you've got two, you have at least two choices. You do something about it or you don't. And so mm -hmm. in this if you're going to do something about it, you bring it up, you have the conversation, let's say, and it might be more than one conversation about being late, let's say, this is what's going on. This is why it's bothering me. This is my request. This is what I would love. Can we make that work? Big picture. They say, mm. oh yeah, of course, like I'll make the changes and then they don't. Then you recognize, okay, it, I'm still being bothered by this. Well, now you have a couple options and it's not saying one or the other, you can do all of these. But one option is you come back to that person, you have the conversation. Hey, you said A, B is still happening. What's going on? Like, what about A didn't work for you? Like, what about you said you would do this, you didn't. Why isn't that happening? Can I help in any way? How are you? This is what going to Jeff's uh, first comment about me, about seeking to understand the other person. If you're doing something, everything we do, we do for a reason. So if a person's consistently late in their mind, that's okay for some reason. Like it's benefiting them yeah. to do that. Yeah. And if I can understand where they're coming from, at least at that point, I can either help them to shift out of it by getting the same reward they were getting for being late. Or the flip side is if something's happening and it's going to keep happening for whatever the reason, I then can say, can I actually be okay with this? Can I be okay with every time we go to a party, if you're my partner, you and I are going to be late. 
if I can be okay with that, then it's not a problem because there are no problems unless you make them a problem. There's just situations. I and so from that space, you either have the conversation and work that out and make that transition, or you recognize how am I making this a problem within myself? Like I'm the one being bothered by this. So how am I creating being bothered? How am I relating to it? How am I holding it in my mind, in my, in my being? And then I can either shift it. So the same thing out there keeps happening, but internally my experience is different or it keeps happening. They're not willing to change. I am not willing to shift internally. So I walk away because, okay. because it's the life that I want to live. Mm -hmm. If I had a business partnership with you and it's really not working and I bring up all the reasons why it's not working. And I do everything I can to work it out with you. And you keep doing all the things that make it not working. At some point, I'm either going to stay and be miserable and suffer, or I'm going to leave. And leaving might suck because I might really like you. But if I leave, then I can partner with somebody that is in alignment with the life that I want to create. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. Against you, there's no, you're a bad person. There's none of that. There's no guilt, blame, shame. There's just, there's a way you're choosing to live your life. And that is not compatible with the way I want to live my life and I'm doing what I can. So if it were in a relationship to create an hour life, but if you're still not willing to play that game, then it's just not going to work. Mm. It right. kind of reminds me of a quote you shared with me a long time ago from uh, Buddha, right? That uh, when he's talking about worry, right? Yeah. He says that um, it never makes sense to worry because you can either do something about it or you can't. And if you can do something about it, you should just go do that. And if you can't, then you should just, worrying doesn't help, right? Yeah. And, I, and it's kind of the same thing in this relationship thing. If someone's doing something that you don't like, there's there's only a couple of possibilities. You can either do something about it. You can have a conversation with them and maybe it'll change. If they decide not to change or they, they're not willing to change for whatever reason, then you have a choice. Can you be okay with it? And if that's the case, then you just figure out how to be okay with it. And if you can't be okay with it, then you can't be in that relationship anymore. That's yeah. really what you're saying, right? It's it's actually a pretty simple perspective. Yeah, it's like I'm in a situation I don't like. If I stay, I either learn to love it or or I suffer. Those are the only options. And if I do, if I can change it, great. And if I can't, those are the, those are the, yeah, and I think too, like, so if we go back to this, like, let's say you're in a relationship with someone who's always being late. Um, you could say to that person, like, this bothers me. And then you can choose like at some level, like if, if I was in a relationship and my girlfriend was constantly late, right. Or my wife was constantly late, I would be like, man, this bothers me because I, I like being on time. That's just a thing for me. I like to be on time. It bothers me when people are late. So if that was a problem for me, then I would have to make a decision. Does the, the good of the relationship balance this thing out, right? And if if I'm like, wow, I really love these 27 things about my girlfriend, <laughs> but I don't like this one thing about her, I can just choose to be okay with it. And then I can just figure out how to like mitigate that part of me that that's bothered by it and say, you know, I'm making a conscious choice to be okay with this. I know she's going to be late. So one of the things I might do is be like, Hey honey, we got to be there at five 30 when really we have to be there at six. And that way we're always 15 minutes early, <laughs> you know, or whatever. Like I can figure out something that works for me. Um, but it is going to come down to first communicating with them. Right. And then the second thing is if that doesn't solve it, deciding whether or not you're okay with it. It's also recognizing when there's progress that you're under appreciating. And so let's say you have a conversation with your partner, intimate business, whatever, and you say, hey, this is what I'm noticing. This is how I'm feeling about it. This is my request. This is what I would love. Can we make that work? And do you have anything you want to share? And then you come up with something and now they say, all right, yeah, I'll do that thing. And let's say over the next 10 times, in this case, being on time, let's say. So then normally 10 times out of 10, they're late. After that conversation, over the next 10 opportunities to be late, they were late five of those times. So that's a massive improvement. But if you're thinking all or nothing, well, we're still late. Then at that point, yeah, you're late. And at the same time, there's an effort there. Like they're trying. Now you get to, for yourself, conclude, is that okay? Like, does it need to be 100% right off the get-go or can it take some time? If you see them making the effort, is that good enough? And there's also a component of 
balance in the, or, or harmony. If I'm the person that always wants to be like on time means half hour early and there's people like that. And then there's the other side of I'm always an hour late. Both of us could benefit from each other. You know, the person who always wants to be early, they might be being a little bit too strict and that might not be serving them in some capacity. So this person kind of relaxes them a little bit on that. But the other person mm -hmm. always late they're going to have people that find that disrespectful. They might have opportunities that are lost. They might have a reputation that, that gets created that's not going to serve them. And so the person that helps them be a little bit more strict with their time benefits them. And so there's that component too. You know, what's interesting about this, I didn't have any idea what we were going to talk about bringing you on. I just knew that it would be great. But, but like I realize now while we're having this conversation that this is the basic formula that we use all the time in our work together right? We're always stopping and saying like, how can I be that's going, you know, like how can I show up in the world that's going to solve for this whatever issue that I'm dealing with, right? And it's literally always the same thing. Like I'm irritated with Jillian and I want to complain to Jamil about Jillian. The conversation is going to be like, Jillian's doing blah, blah, blah. Jillian, just to be clear, I don't usually complain about you to Jamil, but if I did, <laughs> like, you would say to me, okay, well, let's think about this and let's, let's figure out what, you know, how, how are you showing up in this relationship? Because at, at some level, I don't control what Jillian does. If Jillian's doing things that irritating me, irritate me, I can do what, I, it doesn't matter if it's you're late or if, if, you know, I think you're, you know, demanding. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't matter anything, right? At the whole world, if something's happening that that's irritating you, you can't control the thing that's happening. You can only control how you react to it. And we do that all the time. Like one thing that Jamil said to me um, a couple of months ago that really impacted me was, um, uh, geez, then I can forget completely where I was going with this. But there, the thing that he said to me was like, essentially like, um, everything in the world that's happening to you is supposed to be happening to you. And that includes the fact that you want to change it, right? So when something mm -hmm. negative happens, you can stop and say, you know what? This is supposed to be happening to me. And including the fact that I don't like this thing that's happening, it's supposed to be happening to me. So now I have to figure out how do I want to respond to that? Because it, so, it, that, when, you, when yeah. you look at it from that perspective, it forces you to look at what can I do about it? It's like... Um, Hal Elrod's quote that I love to share with people, which is the moment you accept 100% responsibility for everything in your life is the moment you can change anything in your life. I can't change Jamil or Jillian, but I can change how I respond to those people. And that's it. Full stop. Right, 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 right. So um, I, um, I, I saw you say that exact thing in a presentation, Jeff, and then you posted it on social media and then some jerks, for lack of a better term, made a comment that whatever, you know, whatever's supposed to be, what is have, ever's happening to you right now is supposed to be happening. And then people are like, oh, tell it to the people in Gaza. And it's like, well, you can't control Gaza. But I'm asking both of you. When somebody says something like that, like tell that to the people in Gaza, how do you respond to that? What do yeah. you say? Yeah. And so there's two parts to it because this is the, what Jeff just described that I'll add to, I consider it a spiritual truth. Now, oftentimes spiritual truth seems paradoxical. It's almost like, it, how could that possibly be true? Because here's some situations where it seems like it's not. And I'll explain. Um, but one thing mm -hmm. I want to uh, share real quick is using the example of if I say I feel frustrated, who has the problem? You. I, so I feel frustrated yeah. in the relationship. Mm -hmm. I feel frustrated. Like who causes that? Me. But what would I say if I was most people? My partner. It's their behavior mm -hmm. that's frustrating me. But they might not feel frustrated at all. They might be completely oblivious to the fact that what they're doing is bothering me. And so they might feel really happy and joyful and my relationship's great. And in my head, I'm so frustrated and pissed off at them, but I'm doing that. I am doing that by not expressing my truth. I'm doing that by creating a story about all these things. I may be projecting past relationships onto this one 
because my last five partners had a similar quality that I didn't like. Like there's all these mm-hmm. things that we do. And so going back to this quote that Jeff just shared, whatever is happening is supposed to be happening, including my desire to change it. So think of it like this. I live in New York and it was it's, it's not raining right now, but it's been raining like most of the morning. If I were to say to you, I'm really upset right now. And you say, why? And I say, because it's raining. That might, that might confuse you. And you might say, so? And I say, well, it's not supposed to be raining. But says who? Like, that doesn't make any sense. It's not supposed, it is raining. Whatever is happening is supposed to be happening because we live in a universe that's cause and effect. Everything that happened up until this mm-hmm. point, things that you did and didn't do, said, didn't said, didn't say, there's places that you're at, places that you're not. However, you've been showing up, like when you look at your life right now, look at your bank account, look at your relationship, look at your weight, look at any aspect of your life. That's based on all the choices you made and didn't make up until this point. It's based on and that's okay. conscious or not. That's conscious or not. If I live in an environment that's toxic and I don't know it's toxic and I'm getting sick, I'm experiencing the effect of the cause that I chose to live here. Now, I didn't know that this area is toxic, but what I, I'm getting sick. I'm supposed to be getting sick. I'm a plant that you put into toxic soil. Of course, I'm getting sick. That's what happens. But the moment I realize I don't like this, now what's, whatever's happening is what's supposed to be happening, including this desire in me to do something about it. And then if I do something about it, I can change my situation. And then there is to what extent you can change it from a practical component depends on the situation. If I am a using an extreme example, you know, I remember reading Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning. That's one of many like books of Holocaust survivors. If I'm in a concentration camp in Nazi Germany back in the day, my what I can do to get out of that situation is limited. Were there people who managed to escape? Yes. Is it possible that I could be one of those people? Yes. Is it possible more than likely that I probably get killed trying to do that? Yes. Am I okay with that? Maybe. Now, let's say I'm not willing to do that. So I'm going to stay. But then there's the internal game. And then there's a movie that I thought was so wonderful. I believe the movie is called Life is Beautiful. And I believe that's the movie. And there's a father and a son who are in, a, they're, they're, uh, they live in Italy. Uh, they're Jewish. And uh, the mother is Italian. And they all get taken to a concentration camp. The mom gets taken because she's not willing to leave them. And, you know, spoiler alert, my, <laughs> the mom gets killed. So now it's like the son and the father. And the it's based on a true story. And the father doesn't want his son to understand the gravity of the situation that he's in because he's this young boy. So he turns the whole experience of being in a concentration camp into a game. And the father is experiencing basically hell and the kid is having fun and the kid does end up surviving. And so in this example, there's the external, there's certain things I can change and there's certain things I can't. And it's like Jeff said earlier, uh, it's actually the Dalai Lama, but the Dalai Lama quote, if something can be done, there's no need to worry. But if nothing can be done, then worry is of no use. If I'm in jail. I've been getting that wrong for years now. I <laughs> I keep telling people it's Buddha. That's great. So it's the Dalai Lama. I'll remember yeah. that in the future. If I'm in a situation and I genuinely believe I can't do anything about it. Now, keep in mind, I could be wrong. Often I am. There's almost always something you can do about it. But if there, if there genuinely was it, there's still the internal. Viktor Frankl said, The last freedom, the last human freedom that the Nazis couldn't take away is your ability to choose your response. Whatever happens, the way Viktor Frankl put it, is between stimulus and response, between what happens and how you respond is a space. And in that space is your ability to choose your response. Now, that space might be a microsecond. It might feel really narrow, but you always choose your response. You might not be conscious of it. Because you might be so worked up in an anger and whatever emotion that it feels like you just reacted. But there was still a choice there. There was an interpretation. There was a story that you made in a split second and you believed it. So the people in Gaza or wherever else they are, the Nazi Germany story, what can I control? What can I do on the internal to fix my situation as much as I possibly can? And if there was something possible to do on the external, what could I do? What actions could Mm. I take? Is a consequence to every action that you take. So using the Nazi Germany kind of story from Viktor Frankl, there were so many people I'd imagine that tried to get away and they got killed. Mm. But they made a choice Mm -hmm. that I can't stand being here any longer. If I go for it and I make it out, I'm free. 
if I go for it and mm -hmm. I get killed, at least I'm free of this. So they made mm -hmm. that choice. That was their life. That was their decision. So it's like the human experience can be messy. You know, the spiritual truth makes it sound kind of objective. And then you look in the human experience and you go, but what about this? And what about this? And what about that? Yeah, there's a practical component that there's on a way this like self-imposed limitations that our society, that our structure kind of puts on spirit. And so there's still that component of the internal and the external. Before I allude anymore, like, does that make sense, Jillian? To the, that yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, I, you, I don't think we can started, do much better Jillian, than that. By, you started, Jillian, by saying that you wanted to ask both of us that question, but I'm just going to defer to the wisdom of Dr. Jamil on this one. You because, can't add to that. That was yeah, awesome. Nothing I else mean, he pulled said. out... That's he pulled out stuff from Buddha, so like you can't really. Yeah. Well, the Dalai Lama, anyway. Um, <laughs> Dalai but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but no. So, so that actually, yeah, that 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 actually sums up almost three years worth of our work, though. It took me a long time to fully wrap my head around it, and I would encourage people to go back and listen to what he said there about ten times, because that's essentially about how many times it takes to start absorbing this stuff. Um, and that's why we just have to keep repeating it. And that's why I really wanted to have you on today. Um, Jamil, like it's always a pleasure to talk to you. Um, we have to wrap up here in a second, but before we do, I want to ask you one last thing. And that is how can people reach out to you? Um, what's the best way to connect with you? All that kind of stuff. Thank you both so much. And for everyone who tuned in, you know, this has been such a fun experience and it's been a while since I got to connect with Jillian. And so it's always awesome to have these, these moments and, I want to just preface what I'll share to your question with a loving challenge for everyone. Whatever your life situation is right now, your relationship, your finances, your health, your whatever. What if you let go of the past in the sense that I'm going to let go of the control, the power that I'm giving my past over me. I often tell people the past let you go a long time ago, but you keep bringing it back into the present and reliving it. So something happened before, not denying that but it's not happening now. So what if you just let that go? There's a, there's a, this, is a, this is a Buddha quote, Jeff, <laughs> but there's a Buddha perspective of drinking, uh, holding, harboring resentment is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. So where are you yeah. harboring resentment? Where are you holding on to? Something should have happened. It was supposed to happen and it didn't and you're upset with it. It didn't happen. And we said earlier, whatever happened, what was supposed to happen. So it wasn't supposed to happen for whatever the reason. We don't, need to, we don't need to understand that. Yeah. What we can understand is my life right now is a certain way and there's some aspects of it that I'm not okay with. And then my question for you is, what do you want and who are you committed to being in order to make that happen? And when you get really clear, write it down. What are the qualities? What are the attributes? Like, how are you committed to showing up? You'll start to make progress towards that. But keep in mind, I take that word committed seriously, not who are you interested in being if it's comfortable? Who are you committed to being? Because that's the only version of you that's going to turn your relationship around, that's going to turn your health around, that's going to turn your finances around. It can't be maybe sometimes I'll try. Like it's got to be an I'll do it. And if you make mm -hmm. that commitment, it's incredible how quickly your life can change. And Ooh, so I want to editorialize briefly here because I think this is really good. So the way I think about this is, um, when I talk about not having a bad day since I was 17, people will often challenge me on that. And they'll say, that's not possible. You had bad stuff happen to you or whatever. And yeah, I mean, clearly there's stuff that happened to me that objectively I would prefer not to have, have to have lived through. But I refuse to have bad days because I am 100% committed to being that guy that doesn't have bad days. No matter what happens to me, I'm going to find a way to make it positive. And that's really what you're talking about. You're talking about fully living into an identity of being a certain person that acts a certain way. And if you do that, you get to retake control over everything in your life. And that's probably the, the best thing that you've ever taught me. Yeah. Phil, thank you. That, that's an honor to hear. And like in your book, as an example, no bad days, like I love your book. And it reminds me of this perspective. Somebody, I forgot who said it, but it's, did you have a bad day or did you have a bad five minutes that you milked for the rest of the day? <laughs> I love space. that. Like we look at our life and objectively, there's no such thing as a good or a bad day. There's only days. There's only here. There's only now. There's only life. But you interpret it and you label it. 
and language creates. So whatever you label, it becomes that for you. So if I say, how's your day going? And you go, oh, it sucks. And here's why. Well, you're perpetuating whatever the past was into your present, which in, in the present moment is always pregnant with the next moment. So you're creating a future of my life sucks. My day sucks. Like, But you're doing that. It's not happening to you. You're happening to it. And so when you can shift that, which you always have the power to, life changes so quickly. And I want to be respectful of the time that you both uh, committed to this. So to answer your question, Jeff, um, if people are interested in a few different things, if you're interested in content, I've been putting content on social media for about eight years now, maybe longer, and it's over a thousand pieces of content, but I wanted to make 95% of it quick, actionable, small, succinct, a minute or less usually. And you can dive into that and that could definitely shift your perspective throughout the days. You can find that on Facebook and LinkedIn. It's just my name, Jamil Sayage. And on Instagram, it's at Dr. Jamil Sayage, D-R and then my name. Jeff mentioned my podcast, Transformation Starts Today. It's on all the different podcast channels and YouTube. And that's been such a privilege. I'm actually releasing an episode right after this. <laughs> also, I was the first ever guest on that show. So <laughs> I have to start with the most interesting man in the world, you know? <laughs> and yeah, then, uh, that's awesome. Yeah. And then if anyone's interested in having a conversation privately to see if I can support you on your journey to creating whatever it is in your world, I'd love to have that conversation with you. And you can book it at jamilsayers.com and we can see if it's a good fit. Yeah, and we'll put all those links in the show notes as well for you so that you can find them. Thank you so much for being here. Um, as always, it's it's always great to talk to you and we should probably do this more often. Um, although I think I'll speak to you next week because we haven't <laughs> scheduled already. So <laughs> I highly recommend people reaching out to you and, and engaging with your content as well. So Jillian, with that being said, is there anything else that you would like to share with the world before we wrap Everybody, up? Everybody, yes, of course, Jeff. We always want to remind people to live the best version of their last life ever.